So for about uh, 15 years, I've been working on a relationship between philosophy and the sciences, and actually, on my view, the evolution of philosophy and the evolution of the sciences. And then about uh, six, seven years ago, eight years almost, I went into political science and eventually stopped doing this stuff. And then a few years later, after I've stopped really working on the topic, there's an international conference on it. So my timing is a bit off. Um, uh, but the good news is, is that rather than telling you what I'm doing, I'm gonna tell you what you should be doing. So that always, I think is a good thing to do before we have drinks, uh, because um, I'm not doing different stuff. Um, so what I want to do is I want to uh, give you a brief uh, preview of what I what the major themes of the talk are. I'm going to explain to you what this um, why I introduced this notion of synthetic philosophy, or actually uh, I use the term that is a homage to earlier way of doing philosophy, not revive it, but to uh, give it a punchy name. Then I'll explain to you how I got it wrong in 2019. And then I'll do really a long digression on Plato and the division of labor, which really um, has multiple purposes in this talk. Um, and then I'll try to give you a new characterization of synthetic philosophy. Um, um, and then we can go get some champagne. Um, so um, I want to be a bit more precise about what I mean by synthetic philosophy, because it's clear that I wasn't so good at it the last time around. Um, and um, uh, I very much like the terminology of science and philosophy and philosophy and science, uh, but I myself would probably use plurals in that terminology. Um, well, what I'm really interested in conveying to you, um, and this will be my, my use of, uh, I guess, uh, baby economics, is that the advanced division of cognitive labor really generates big social and epistemic challenges and externalities. And in fact, what I'm going to suggest to you, this is kind of foundational to Athens and Jerusalem. So if you think there is a kind of civilizational trajectory, we can find it at the start. It's not a feature of modernity. So this idea that philosophy splits off, that the science is split off from philosophy, and that um, um, these are new problems, I'm going to deny that. We can see them in the foundational text of these traditions. Um, there's a bit of anachronism, sorry about that, but we, we agree it's a lot now. Um, and so one payoff is going to be that the science, that, the, that it's really a myth that sciences and philosophy have only recently separated. That's an optical illusion. It's true for one or two sciences, but it's not really uh, fundamentally true. And I hope thereby to reject also the lone genius model of philosophy. But the more important payoff is going to be is that um, how to think about what the division of labor does also generates opportunities for philosophy and in particular for philosophy of science. That's the real, the positive part of the talk. And maybe this will be a useful foundation myth for the MPP. Okay, that's uh, my, my task. We are already to the point of meat. <laughs> <laughs> we are already When it's capitalized, it's the center. When it's lower capitals, it's you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so um, when I uh, um, wrote my paper on synthetic philosophy and biology and yeah. philosophy, uh, by the way, this paper went viral and actually ended up on curricula. Um, and I get emails about it uh, a couple of times a week from students who are asking me what I really meant. Um, <laughs> um, so I really have four motives in writing this paper. Um, uh, and the first one is a kind of uncomfortable truth. And that is, is that philosophy of science and philosophy of special sciences are really have become oddballs in the professional philosophy profession. It doesn't mean that they're like low status or that people aren't interested in it. In fact, science has considerable <laughs> prestige in, in, the, in, in, the, in philosophy. Um, but it's also, uh, when you look at self-descriptions about what the core of philosophy is, metaphysics, epistemology, language, and logic, with logic actually also having a tenuous status 
in some respects. Philosophy of science is not part of that narrative. Um, and in addition, there's this further weird fact, actually also internalized in the MPP, is that some of the sciences get almost no attention from philosophy whatsoever. What? Um, the other point that I want to highlight, and this is not internal to the profession, but really society, is that what we're seeing in society, and I'll say a lot more, well, not a lot because we want to get champagne, I will say a bit more about is that the extensive division of labor really creates important social problems. I think we've seen this in the pandemic, by the way. It's not like a hypothetical example. Um, the other stuff, and again, this is uh, for the champagne. In my view, the tradition that I was indoctrinated or uh, educated in when I was a grad student, namely HPS, that's really stagnant. Even Catherine, who really is HPS, is now doing something much closer to sociology of science than HPS. Right? Not that that's bad. I love her stuff, but something has happened with HPS um, where the Pitt department, a long time standard bearer, has no, has very few historians doing pre 20th century uh, sciences. Right? Uh, uh, Chicago, other places too. And so <laughs> another reason why I wanted to write this paper is, is actually when we're writing grant proposals, we need to explain what we're doing. And if we appeal to what the analytic philosophers are doing, we actually say weird stuff about what we're doing. I'm not going to um, elaborate that on today. You can read the paper, etc. So let me go a bit through that. Um, uh, my claim is that what philosophy of science is doing doesn't fit easily in the self-image of contemporary analytic philosophy. I think the whole conference proved that. None of the papers we gave, the philosophers on this group, um, um, is like the papers you see in the contemporary analytic philosophy conferences and even in the journals. There's overlap, there are arguments, there are concepts, there's rigor, but it's not, it's not the same thing. Um, we don't create necessary and sufficient conditions. We're not working by a uh, by, uh, method of a uh, counterexample. Um, we're not even, which we could do, modeling conceptual modal space. Right? This is now the, pop, the, the, the method that's on the opposite plane. Um, and we're also not doing where we create dilemmas and trilemmas for ourselves and make progress by rejecting one of the premises or one of the, one of the options. That's just not how we're doing a philosophy of social, a science of social science. Right? And these are the main contenders in the mainstream. Um, and this is a bit of an impolite thing to say. When other philosophers look at what we philosophers of science do, we look like we're doing bad conceptual analysis. Interestingly enough, we heard a lot of scientists say we're doing good conceptual analysis for them. So I'm not saying we need to raise our standards as conceptual analysts. I'm just saying, like, from the professional point of view, uh, we're not quite making the cut. Obviously, these are all defeasible claims, uh, anecdotal sociology, champagne stuff, etc. But I, I actually think this is more or less true. Okay. Not a more uh, important uh, social argument for the stuff. Um, Hyperspecialization, a term I, I get from Elijah Milgram's The Great Endarkment, um, actually generates serious social problems. And by, by this hyperspecialization, I mean cognitive, intellectual, scientific hyperspecialization. There might be many others that uh, alienation. Um, you know, that kind of self mental mutilation, I'm not worried about them. So, um, Elijah focuses primarily on the linguistic and cognitive barriers between disciplines. In fact, um, does this work? Oh, this is uh, the Tower of Babylon, right? And what he nicely shows in his book, this really is the opening chapter, is that if you read the Tower of Babylon carefully, it's, among other things, a story about how hyper-specialized, uh, skilled laborers can't talk to each other 
and that the coordination cost of building up becomes so big that it leads to um, uh, an implosion. I'm summarizing his account. Go read the Bible version. Of, um, I used to be a shiver boy. It's, it's really a plausible analysis. He's not making it up. Um, I mean, I became quickly atheist, so that was a very brief energy <laughs> um, Now, the next claim is actually hard to take for smart people, educated people, but most of our views that are scientific and technical in character that are outside our niche are basically authoritative. We take them on trust or on authority from legitimate epistemic authorities. We're reading um, 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 science or nature or journal or maybe the economist or the New York Times to give us summaries of what's going on in other fields. Uh, we talk to colleagues. Um, we try to stay up to date and, um, and, and have interesting things to say about it. Um, that also means that as an academy, we became very vulnerable to the replication crisis because we had to assume that what they were doing elsewhere was sort of okay. I'm not saying there were no warnings. In fact, one of the really irritating things I think about the replication crisis is that the people that for years had said something, that something is amiss, don't actually got the credit after it was unmasked, right? So there's also incentive issues. I'm not gonna to be uh, touching on these especially. Um, it's a further problem that this exists for academic administrators, grant agencies, government policy, and journalism, right? That became apparent, very apparent during the pandemic because we actually couldn't decide for over a year and a half who the right experts were. Have we decided? I don't think so. I mean, Rob, you accept it, of course. Um, Right? And I actually also think that in many universities, this also explain why our bosses generally talk uh, procedure and sound ever more vacuous. But they're, they're smart people, but they understand the limitations of their knowledge. And so rather than looking like ignoramuses, they start doing organizational stuff. But a university that has a president that feels very confident in his or her intellectual abilities, like Chapman, is really unusual. I'm sure he irritates and offends people too a lot. Um, but and the thing that you always should know is that a lot of people I know know great science journalists who they reliably trust, except when they talk about their own fields. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow <laughs> we have to live with this, right? Uh, uh, last point, and this is actually a rather important issue in philosophy of law and administration. This is why judges and lawyers and bureaucrats focus so much on procedure. They realize that they lack the substantive knowledge to make claims about content. Right? But none of us believe qua philosophy of science or even science that getting the procedures right is a reliable method or truth. I mean, I'm not saying you should do bad procedures, but uh, that's that's another question, right? So this is a kind of a, um, a, a, a kind of equilibrium for not getting it wrong too often. So um, um, I've, for the first time in my life, published in a kind of mid-level economics journal to describe this. So this is what the intellectual background of the what I'm doing today. So in 2019. Um, 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 I managed not to convince the people I wanted to convince in a way that's really annoying. Um, so synthetic philosophy is a style of philosophy that brings together insights, knowledge, and arguments from the special sciences with the aim to offer a coherent account of complex systems that connects these to wider culture, other philosophical projects, or both. Um, <laughs> the rest of the paragraph is also important, um, but the highlighted part is what got me into trouble. So um, the highlighted part, for the sake of argument, we're going to call the integrative conception of synthetic philosophy. What synthetic philosophers do is bring sciences together and glue them into a coherent whole. And um, 
I then somewhat mistakenly added another paragraph uh, of content. So the rest of the paper was a book review of Dennett and Peter Godfrey Smith's recent work. Um, also had quite a bit on Rachel Carson and, uh, and Darwin in it. Um, but then um, um, I added this paragraph. In this paragraph, I have a feeling the people who ran with what I say, they didn't read this. So this uh, synthetic re philosophy requires a general theory, uh, such as Darwinism or game theory, information theory, and perhaps Bayes' theorem, that is thin and flex. I mean, very ambivalent about Bayes' theorem, so I really <laughs> don't want to encourage, but that is thin and flexible enough to be applied in different special sciences, but rich enough that when it when applied, it allows for the connections to be developed among them. Right, so this is really the integrative glue of a kind of general purpose theory. And what I want to claim is that what philosophers of science have is a kind of special expertise around such theories. That doesn't mean we're the only people that have such expertise. It doesn't mean that everything we do is about generating this expertise, but a lot of philosophers of science have actually quite an um, um, interesting layer of sophistication when they think about such theories. Actually, the previous talk nicely illustrates that. Uh, Adam Love's talk nicely illustrates that, et cetera. Um, and what I'm claiming is, is, as philosophers of science have been doing this all along, both in the normative and political realm, which is why Rachel Carson is so important, but also in uh, philosophy, biology, and uh, consciousness, et cetera. Um, importantly for my narrative, this means that philosophers can give birth to new projects in ph philosophers of science and new projects in philosophy and new projects in science. And I, I gave examples of that in the, in the paper. Um, and I feel like uh, your paper came out in 2019 and 2021, we were more or less on similar tracks. I mean, you have much better data than I do such some of this. Um, okay, nice pictures. <laughs> More nice, same nice pictures. I mean, I think the Peter Godfrey Smith picture is a bit of a disaster, but uh, <laughs> um, okay. So uh, what happens? Actually, this is a nice Dennettian thought experiment. Do you prefer to be cited, or do you prefer to be understood? I always thought that I preferred to be cited, but this paper has disabused me a bit from it. <laughs> uh, it is being cited to generate lots of, uh, not just in the blogosphere and on Twitter, uh, but uh, good people are putting citations of this paper into their books and papers. Um, and the problem is, is that the way it was interpreted, um, the focus was really on the integrative element. Um, and then the position actually comes rather close to Kitcher's version of pragmatism, which he actually himself also sometimes calls synthetic philosophy. I did not realize that, uh, but there are one or two places where he does that. Now, the problem from my perspective with Kitcher's approach is that it's fundamentally a, a, the philosophical art. It's this kind of genius moment where you take together all these disparate products and like a wonderful chef, you bring them together and voila. But this is no diss of Kitcher. He's, he has lots of other things he does very well and that I admire, but this thing I think is a bad model for philosophy. Um, and he himself uh, rejects the idea that there is such a thing as philosophic expertise, uh, even though he's very much an egalitarian in all kinds of ways. Um, but I think this is not a good uh, model for philosophers to emulate. Um, I reject it for anthropological reasons, but also for political reasons. I, do, I don't like this picture. Uh, it's the wrong sort of elitism, in my view. Um, other oops is that what I thought was I was clever. Actually, Tim Lemwitz also has a book review of Sterelli, not surprisingly, that actually lists very similar criteria as I do. Okay, so then I got this invitation. What am I going to talk about? Um, okay, so um, we're going to go back to Plato. Um, I want to remind you that the advanced division of cognitive labor is foundational to the Republic. In fact, arguably it's a great work in economics for this reason, um, right? It's uh, importantly, it's the cause of all political life. It's very explicit about this. Um, you may remember that the philosopher King is basically a class 
or case that gets bred in order to have certain cognitive abilities um, um, and in order to defend and rule the Calipolis. Um, and in order to get there, uh, Marco alluded to this in his uh, dinner speech the other night, is you have to pass through a whole range, a whole curriculum of all the sciences. And it's like, what, 20 years, 30 year process, and then you get on top, right? So the only way to overcome the cognitive division of labor from the point of view of uh, political administration is to master all the sciences. And not only that, uh, we're also going to reorganize uh, society in order to make it work. Right? I'll just say a bit more about that. But it's not just in the philosopher king part where the cognitive division of labor matters. Uh, the ship of state and uh, parable, uh, very popular uh, in the Middle Ages, I should say, too, um, uh, basically is an account. Uh, that criticizes democratic elites on many, many grounds, but two of the main criticisms are that on the one hand, democratic elites claim there's no skill in ruling, there is no expertise here. And on the other hand, they claim that when there is a demagogue, that that person actually is a real ruler and has the skill and actual piloting has, is, not, is, is not of a ship of state, is no skill at all. Right, so um, the, the part of his critique of democratic life and democratic elites in particular is that they 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 want to have their cake and eat it too, and deny uh, and deny political expertise. Uh, it also shows up in the statesman where um, the stranger explains the nature that we have laws because society cannot be trusted of agreeing on genuine expertise. This is a bug of democracy. Um, if you look at his criticisms of um, sophistry, this, uh, they're, they're fake experts. And when you look at his criticism of poetry and arts, the issue returns again. Why? Why? Uh, this is particularly at the beginning of book 10. The poets do not understand, do not know what they described. And this, for those of you who are not familiar with philosophy and the Republic, the poets are the major cultural and religious producers of society. They frame the self-understanding of any society in, in the Greek world. This is why they matter. They're not, uh, they're not people who, who, who write uh, a few lines and then, and then go drink to themselves because nobody listens. Um, now, uh, interestingly enough, one of the problems with the poets, there are many, is that they um, are totally ignorant of the greatest and most beautiful things, warfare, generalship, and then the city administration, which is an expertise on his view, um, and a person's education, right? Um, and, in, and the reason why the poets get away with this he's a proto-analytic philosopher, is that both the poets and the people lack the right distinctions, right? Particular the difference between imitation, knowledge, and uh, lack of knowledge. Um, he, he's inventing ignorance on these. Um, now, um, if you think about the argument, uh, this generalizes to all expertises. And in fact, that's very much implicator of the argument. Now, um, um, Socrates doesn't think that the poets do society generally because there are products that we consume where they're so, if they're defective or don't work, we eventually realize it, right? We don't figure out why it worked, but we know if it worked, right? Now, now I'm going to do a bit of textual hermeneutics. I'm not going to read it. Um, but um, a, a certain daemon is introduced at some point. Uh, Adamantus says, yes, uh, uh, more yes. And then suddenly this daemon dude is introduced um, as an expert on the representational qualities of, of different kinds of rhythms and music. And um, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but it, up until the early modern period, music was considered one of the main sciences, music theory. Right, uh, so one of the stories I'm trying to teach you is, is that some sciences are sciences for a very long time and then stop being considered it. Um, and that creates part of the optical illusion 
that philosophy is the mother of all the sciences. Um, um, now, Damon is introduced for two explicit reasons. Number one, in order to save time in a conversation, right? It's an efficiency argument. And number two, because Damon has specific expertise that has eluded Socrates on the nature of music. And in fact, if you look at the text, there are all this terminology where um, um, Anipolos, a composite foot, a doctor, a heroic foot, where Socrates kind of admits he's not quite sure what they mean. Right? He's um, now it's quite natural to read this satirically because we know that Socrates is a uh, is a critic of the sophists, and Damon was a student of the of the sophists. But I'll get to that in a second. Um, but notice too that in fact his terminology is part of the barrier of understanding, right? That really anticipates Milgram's point. Um, now, um, I should say, by the way, I teach the Republic nearly every year, now that I'm political science. I always assumed he was a fake character like Mirtima in a symposium. I, I didn't pay much attention to him. But it's this passage that really is important. For a change to a new type of music, is something to be aware of as a hazard of all our future fortunes. For the modes of music are never disturbed without unsettling the most fundamental political and social conventions, as Damon affirms and as I'm convinced. And this is not a side comment, this is fundamental to the whole political science of the Republic. Right? And music is a source of stability. And if you shift music, and in their, their age, it doesn't just mean a nice fiddle, it means how you train people, um, how you educate people, uh, what's, what performances are allowed, these are all part of music. Um, and what's interesting here is that Damon is accepted by Socrates as an accepted expert pertaining to music and its social impact. He is the authority. Of course, Socrates affirms it, right? And crucially, um, uh, music is really constitutive here of political life, right? So in our terminology, we would say culture. So um, from Socrates' point of view, Damon's expertise is an essential component to the skill of ruling a society or the art of government. Um, um, and um, um, in high esteem. <laughs> Um, and Socrates agrees that if you start innovating in music, this is why Plato gets called a conservative by uh, Mopper, by the way, this is <laughs> this material, um, uh, you undo the stability of the pilot. Okay, it turns out that once you pay attention to Damon, he's all over Plato's corpus. He's actually mentioned many times and always approvingly too. Um, and I'm not the only one that noticed this. I'm certainly not the first person. Uh, this is Plutarch a couple hundred years later in his account of Pericles, uh, actually starts the account of Pericles with an account of Damon. Right, and Pericles is the greatest uh, imperial ruler of Athens that Athens ever had. He was the, uh, the, 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 the democratic leader. And we're presented as if Damon is the man behind the throne. Right, so this is a, a big deal in, in Greek life. Okay. Um, if you want to know more about it, read Real Scholars. Um, okay, so here's what I want you to take away. In the Republic, there are really two main models on how to think about the challenge of what the division of the advanced division of cognitive labor does. The best model, the Calipolis, is a complete reorganization of society where you breed an elite knowledge class, which has long training, as free to poor, no property, etc. Uh, uh, wives and men in common. Uh, I'm sure you, you've heard of that. Um, and then you censor anything that might distort the epistemic environment, right? And this is the model that's explicitly theorized and is thought of as Plato's uh, utopia. But there's also a second best model, which is instantiated by the way that Socrates is represented. Right? And this Socrates operates within the division of cognitive labor in a complex society, um, differentiated society. And interestingly enough, what we're shown is, is that in the second best model, the different kinds of expertise 
can check on each other. Socrates doesn't claim that he doesn't understand Damon altogether, but that he partially understands. And that foreshadows Polyani's rep Republican model of science, right? And this is left to the reader. So you, you can uh, not disagree here, but here you could say this I made up, right? But that's why I spent time on Damon. Um, now, there are, of course, many other theoretical models of how to think about this. An important one is uh, uh, Ben Salem and New Atlantis, which shaped the Royal Society, where you put all the nerds in a theological political institute and you shield them from society. And you, let, and you really have a very, very advanced division of neighbor. Um, New Atlantis is uh, 30 pages. Read it on the flight home. You'll laugh, you'll cry. Um, the 20th century philosophy of science, the high theory, has other theories about how to do this. Right, Neurath is a hero of the contemporary left, Kleinian regimentation, less so. Um, and what we really do is something like this in our time. Okay, so here's the upshot. Uh, I want you to come away with this thought that in fact, uh, Plato doesn't want us to think of Socrates as an isolated gadfly, the lone genius model that I reject. Maybe the real Socrates was that, right? And the Republic is like uh, Plato Socrates. I'm not taking a stance on that debate. Um, um, in fact, very importantly, when he founds the Gallipolis, Socrates says, hey, before we do all the important religious institutions, let's send a messenger to the Temple of Apollo and have a whole list of practices from them. I'm not, I'm not going through the list because I don't think you would be interested, but uh, it's a long list. Um, and what I want to claim then is insofar as Plato is the daddy of uh, European American philosophy, this is a problem that's constitutive to our enterprise, and it wasn't forgotten. Bacon's New Atlantis is about the same issue, right? So there's an interesting fact that we are stuck with a myth that, um, that started really, I think, in the 19th century, because theology was the queen of the sciences originally. That got demoted, and somebody thought it must have been a good joke to say that philosophy is now that thing, right? But that's a different project. I also think this is why philosophers themselves keep policing other projects, right? Uh, we are aware that this is an issue, our status. Okay, um, this is the chat CTP version of the standard myth. Um, I saw a lot of scientists use chat CTP in this way. So this is a kosher practice. Um, it's clearly true for psychology particularly modern psychology, not ancient psychology and medieval psychology, but it's clearly true for modern, right? Not to forget that modern psychology has also roots in medicine. There's a story to be told that modern psychology starts in Montpellier and not with Wundt. I mean, Montpellier in, in the Middle Ages, but that's a different, different lecture, right? It's also sort of true of mainstream physics, but there are two, that comes also out of the study of machines, which is not what physicists did. Um, okay, I already told you this. Um, some other hints that something is amiss with the standard myth. Um, astronomy is a ridiculously old science. It very clearly predates philosophy. And in, um, in, the, in the Hittite and Babylonian temples, I've actually written on this, it's conjoined with political economy of all things. And there's really no evidence of philosophic reflection, much to my annoyance. I do think they were doing option market trading, so um, they, they, were, they were not being silly. Uh, botany also predates philosophy, actually all over the world. We know this, right? A medicine arguably predates philosophy. Although I think it remains uh, intertwined. Geolis geology, um, wasn't birthed by philosophy, but by Renaissance humanism as a modern science, whatever that means, right? That's the narrative. I actually think Al Biruni is also a cool person to talk about. And then geography is indeed both philosophy, but if you look at Strabo, he's clearly trying to tell future military leaders how to rule the world. Okay, enough said. How am I doing on time? 
I don't want to keep you. Uh, have a few more minutes? Okay, cool. Okay, so here's how I'd like to restate the uh, end of rent. Uh, here's how I'd like to restate synthetic philosophy. It's a style philosophy that presupposes or develops expertise in a general theory or a model or a certain method or technique that is thin and flexible enough to be applied in and to different special sciences, but rich enough that when applied, it allows for connection to be developed among them, is the aim to offer a coherent account of complex systems that connect these to a wider culture, the sciences, or other philosophic projects. I think most of you are safe as synthetic philosophers. You can be slotted into this. So what I'm suggesting is we need an umbrella term that is a proper image for the philosophy of science, self-image, and that also can explain to others why it is we don't do what I like philosophers do. That's really what I'm trying to do. Um, so now the emphasis is more on the expertise and less on the integrative gluing, but the integrative gluing is still there. Um, so um, here's a very preliminary list of things that might fit in. Notice too, um, uh, I put Latour in here, right? I don't think this is just things, uh, it's not a commitment merely to naturalism or scientific naturalism. It's not a commitment to analytic philosophy. I think anything that's not mystical and mysterious, but that can be intelligibly explained to others and transferred in, what's the word? Uh, can be transferred in quasi-standardized way, can fit the bill. Hermeneutics too. Um, uh, but he said this, okay, so... I do think that synthetic philosophy uh, has some uh, important benefits. It's really a means of disciplining philosophy. Um, uh, we really should be focused on generating expertise. I mean, I'm in political science, I mean, you guys. Um, um, I actually think it's a way to keep philosophy salient in a modern uh, university. Problem is, of course, and that was the list I started with is already clear, it's not always obvious that it will be housed in philosophy, but in interdisciplinary programs. That's where the action might well end up being. Um, um, Wishy-washy is a technical term. Okay, wrapping up. So my view is, is that rather than being all these heterogeneous different things that philosophy of science is, we need a clearer identity of what philosophy of science can be and is. And that's why I'm proposing this. Um, we can thereby also overcome the analytic continental divide, which I think has really uh, outlived its usefulness. Um, on my view, then philosophy can contribute to ongoing science. Um, I set this. Um, very important in my view then, we can not only bring disciplines together, but actually find new sciences or create new project in philosophy, it'll be doing as well. Um, um, important point, of course, sometimes the same formal apparatus, looking at them in different fields is unilluminating. Um, I have friends who I accuse of this regularly, I won't name names, uh, but you only can discover this a posteriori. So here's the upshots. Synthetic philosophy is an alternative to analytic philosophy. It's not the same thing. Oh, did I like? Uh, but in principle, compatible with it. Because uh, you can't imagine a division of labor in which the synthetic philosopher generates and supplies premises for analytic philosophy. Um, but of course, the goal is this ultimate domination. We want to displace them. <laughs> Right. This is uh, this is not this is not where we want to end up. Um, yeah, that's it. Let's pardon. <laughs> hey, we have time for questions. Yes. So thanks for the pre presentation of this big project. For you, for you. which is already known by many, by many people. Sure. So uh, I, I had three reactions because you, you gave us too much for immediately reacting in a detailed way and in an argumented way. 
So I, I had three remarks. The first one was that uh, at the beginning of, of the presentation, I heard synthetic philosophy as meaning an alternative to analytic philosophy, but then in between, I had the feeling that it was lost. It came again at the end, uh, I agree. But uh, in between, I had the impression that uh, your major uh, theme was uh, uh, the division of labor. Yes, and uh, and the way you treat the division of so I I I I, I receive division of labor as a Marxist teacher, uh, and uh, I had the feeling that I had the impression that uh, the way you were actually treating this uh, division of labor, uh, the issue was rather heterogeneity. Uh, that synthetic philosophy has to admit that there is a big heterogeneity between uh, human practices or human experiences. Uh, so, and, uh, but it's, it's an important shift because the issue is not exactly the same, whether, whether, whether it is division of labor or, heter or heterogeneity. And so my, my, my third remark, and my, which is also a question, because if you, if you interpret Socrates, which is the second best solution in your presentation, as uh, uh, someone who mediates between expertise uh, with his particular position of ignorance and, question, and questioning, uh, then it seems that uh, uh, what synthetic philosophy has to do uh, is, is not necessarily connected with the theoretic part uh, with knowledge and science. So uh, my question is, in your perspective, is it obligatory that uh, your synthetic philosophy should still be under the paradigm of science? Um, that's the first question almost. So uh, I very much like um, uh, your observation that um, um, I'm conflating the division of labor with heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. But I view the division of labor as a source of difference and differentiation. I actually think when I speak to a liberal political philosopher, I think that's a good thing. There, there are externalities and bad things to it, uh, as Adam Smith and Marx teach. Um, uh, but I think uh, as a whole, uh, uh, differentiate, that it differentiates is a good thing. Um, um, I um, uh, on the point of how to understand Socrates is, um, I think, um, 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 I actually think that in the Republic, with Socrates as the skeptic and mediator, he's less skeptic and less, less paradigmatic like that, because he actually says here, he affirms and I'm convinced, right? So this is really... A, a different Socrates than the one that's the heroic true speaker to power that I think philosophy likes to present, pretend it is. Right? I think that image doesn't do justice to the, our cowardly nature, but also actually doesn't articulate what our expertise really is. And so I think in the Republic, we're actually given a different, a really different Socrates than that skeptical one. I mean, leaving aside the myth of her and all the other stuff where he does, you know, very unskeptical. But um, then I forgot the first question, but I'm sure I agree. It was about uh, synthetic philosophy as an alternative to... Uh, yeah, I, I think the paper has, has that you out. Then you said, you said also other things. You said that uh, it, it legitimates uh, analytic philosophy in a way. Um, I didn't mean to say that, but I think that would be a fair way to read what my last two slides are doing, yes. <laughs> uh, but that also means that I think that as analytic philosophy is proceeding, that there's also something amiss there, right? So I'm not, so I, you get that right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. So uh, can we introduce an additional dynamic to the um, uh, dialectic, which is the sociological structure of uh, uh, knowledge, especially as it's bureaucratized in the modern university. Because it seems like a key part of the story and part of the reason why the 19th 
the 20th century transition is so important is because that's the moment when the experts have to live in a particular place um, and they have to find a home within its many rooms uh, if they're going to survive. And of course, in an interesting quirk of history, but probably quite explicitly, philosophy disciplines last, right? The, the, the thing that was around long time is the thing that actually disciplines quite late, as opposed to the areas of the science which quickly discipline, um, especially to like the 1860s and 1870s. Um, so I'm curious to hear you comment on some of this because I think it's relevant to your story, but it wasn't an explicit part of it, at least tonight. Um, yeah, so um, my, uh, today I abstracted away from incentives generally, which is actually rather important in my own work in thinking about this thing. And indeed I abstracted away from national context and also from uh, the institutions where we end up in. Uh, I don't think that's only universities, by the way, I mean, uh, specialized research institutes as well. I also don't think um, that we were forced into the university uh, insofar as um, late 19th century, early 20th century science. Also, um, 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 we like the money that and access to power that came with being part of all kinds of institutions. Um, but that's uh, that's a totally different lecture. Um, I am not a hundred percent sure that philosophy uh, discipline lasts uh, because already in the nineteenth century we get quite a few textbooks. I mean, really textbooks in our sense of what philosophy is in universities. Um, it's part of the curriculum. Um, I mean. In the sense that we recognize not just the word, but I mean, they're doing the kind of thing that uh, that sounds, you know, German university professors and Dutch university professors and, and, and particularly British university professors in philosophy. They're doing the kind of thing we're doing. Um, some of them do a lot more too, right? So I'm not denying that uh, uh, that, that also exists. But uh, um, I actually think we get in well before uh, um, geography and, and, ge and geology, right? So I actually, uh, I, I, would, I would be cautious. I think really the kind of narrative that you articulated is part of the myth that I want us to start questioning and that I don't think are useful for places like this where they're trying to build up a new thing. Um, um, but, but different countries and different systems have slightly different narratives, which is, but makes it hard to say, well, it's really that, or really not that. Um, Marco. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to mention something that I don't know whether you know, possibly not, because it's a very within the division of labor. It's a book originally written in Spanish, interpreted both in English, in French, and in English by Fernando Zalamea. It is called synthetic philosophy yeah. of contemporary mathematics. Yes, yes. Uh, um, I, I discovered that uh, uh, as people started telling me, hey, Kitcher, and did you mean Spencer? And I said to myself, you know, it might be useful to scholar Google the term. <laughs> uh, uh, and then I discovered it. And, uh, so, so in, a, in a sense, yeah. uh, it's uh, quite a different from you. It's a real proposal because it's uh, absolutely central on mathematics. Okay. Uh, in a very technical way. Yeah. But on the other sense, it was close to your proposal because the idea of Fernando is exactly to have a, a comprehensive view yeah. of mathematics yeah. and not simply on foundation of logical uh, question. Okay. Yeah. It's a bit closer to picture than me, is yeah. what I would say. Okay. This is for simply to, to, to mention this. Uh, his book, and by the way, he is much more anti-analytical philosophy mm. than you. Oh, and to lie in right analytical. I cannot escape my relationship. Okay, that's another. Thing. Okay, no. Uh, let's get to the to the basic point. You said that in one of the slides in the beginning that in a sense uh, the philosophy of science, in the singular, as it was conceived uh, twenty years ago, is in crisis or something. Uh, yeah. You know more there. 
Okay. Mm. That is obvious, it seems to me, and empirical evidence. But why? Uh, it seems to me that the, the essential point leave uh, age apart. Mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, uh, the, the, the classical uh, the classical topic that uh, the, the golden age of philosophy of science, of philosophy of science uh, was at the center of scientific progress appeared to be evident at certain moment. Uh, Developed uh, some ideas, some presented, uh, and that then what we can say more uh, that is in some sense, and that this was uh, in, in the favor of philosophy of science, philosophy in the plural of science, philosophy of physics, philosophy of biology, philosophy of mathematics. What we have tried to today is really to go something like that in this conference to add a look not at mathematical physics, but at science. But in order to do that, we are trying to identify a question, not a method. The method, I don't know, we are too far from the method, I don't know whether you will arrive, but the question is a question of utility. So my impression, and it's not a criticism, it's a real question, is okay, you identify a perspective. The method, the upside, I don't know, but what is the concept? What is the question that you would like to address or you suggest us to address with, with synthetic, synthetic philosophy? The question of utility that we presented here, we try to discuss here in one. I don't know whether it is the good one or not, but what are the questions that you would like to synthetic philosophy address? Um, um, um. I have a not good answer to that, but that's because I feel very uncomfortable legislating for others what they want to have ought to research in part because um, now that I really am a political theorist and I'm not going to even be accountable for my words uh, because I'm not going to be doing it myself. I think I, I should be cautious, but I do think uh, there are genuine social and uh, scientific problems, where as uh, Jim very nicely pointed out, having a discipline that has a different set of norms, a different set of uh, uh, success conditions than other disciplines, but that is a place where expertise can be cultivated, could be both um, valuable to the sciences and valuable to society, and I actually think uh, valuable to philosophy in its uh, intrinsic sense. I think as a survival strategy, I'm, I'm sketching a roadmap um, myself. Uh, I, you know, I, I think we, we, we should not think that philosophers can adjudicate between the sciences, particularly like when the pandemic happened. Some of us were tempted by that. You know, I co-authored with Eric Winsberg, so I'm uh, I'm not immune to the all of that, uh, that, that, that pull. But my feeling is, is my task for today is just to convince you we need a good self-image. I give you that self-image. And then it's really, uh, if you want to pursue the roots. You would say that it's more sociologically that, uh, uh, so to say, uh, intellectual uh, perspective? Well, I, I, I'm a philosopher. Yeah, but, but what do you mean, major? That is a, uh, what, 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 what the question to gain the, any major? What the part? What, what, I, I, I understand, but it's not understand enough. So, yeah. what, what an image is. Yeah. So, uh, I have a paper on that. I'll send it to you. Um, but I think, uh, and actually, Williamson in the philosophy, philosophy uh, has a similar but a different content. I think in the uh, Pino's paper, actually, also shows this, I think it matters to intellectual enterprise that the narratives and self-understanding fit uh, the purpose. Those of us who are in philosophy of science who come out of analytic philosophy, which is not the majority, but the chunk, we really don't have a good narrative of what we do. Um, I think it's okay for the philosophers of physics to say, look, we're actually a certain kind of physicist 
in the Vatsi department, and that's actually a great position to be in, but that's not a good position for the rest of us. Right? Um, a, because we're not physicists, and B, because we can't, if I send the economist in the Vatsi department, that won't get me a lot of credit. And so I think that's, that's purely from an instrumental, you need a good account. But I also think that insofar as we see that we can help shape science and science can help shape us, I think it's a means toward uh, allowing a more inquisitive attitude into philosophy. Because I actually think we often close doors to each other. Thank you. So uh, this is a very interesting area. Um, I was kind of struck though by like what feels to me like a tension between the uh, the the um, big picture uh, self image you're offering to us uh -huh. and uh, the list of, of tools that you're recommending to us. Not on this slide, but the one where you have yeah. you know game theory and uh, yes, but that's uh, meant to be open ended. But you're right. Yeah. Well. Open ended, fine, but all of the examples you give look to me to be, um, and I, I say this as someone who has worked in many of these, um, kind, kind of uh, myopic. You know, they're, they're, they can't do that much. What they can do, there's some things they can do well, but they can't do that much well. I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to say that somehow we, you know, the, the future of philosophy in the world is to, to try to fit everything into agent based models. Probably for the models. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to understand how we should think about that list vis a vis the, the big picture vision. So I view the items on that list as things uh, philosophers of science could potentially claim genuine expertise in both in their foundations and in their applicability. Sometimes that already requires a team. Like we can't all be Peter Gotti Smith and go on with our scouts or, or Dan Dana to do it, you know. Uh, um, so I actually view these as, as sites of expertise. And I don't claim that we need to limit, as philosophers of science, need to limit ourselves to just one, right? For some PhD students, that's the right thing, but I'm not claiming that. Um, um, I'm also not claiming that this is all that philosophy should do, right? What I'm trying to articulate is, is what is distinctive about philosophy of science in our day and age. Uh, and then um, while making it also uh, uh, salient to some very big issues, right? How do I navigate for society and also in the academy what uh, the division of labor, what these, what I call externalities, because I'm hung out with the Chapman economists too much, is, um, is uh, I think, really are, they're really important issues. And that I tried to motivate, I tried to motivate in paper, but obviously that uh, required much longer narrative. Now, um, I am certainly not against a philosopher of science saying, look, I don't want to solve social problems or those kind of epistemic problems, right? What I'm, I'm saying to that philosopher of science, actually, if you call yourself a synthetic philosopher and you are working on something technical class philosopher of science, you can find refuge in this much larger umbrella. Term. Right? So uh, in that sense, I do think it's a, uh, it's a, a big thing. Um, are there philosophy of science projects that wouldn't fit at all in this? I'm open to that suggestion, but actually, uh, maybe that's the tension you feel like, maybe that turns it then into something trivial. Um, but um, that I have to think for um, Did I answer? Um, well, you give some answers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I have the feeling that you recommend a Trotskyist dissidence. Okay. Yeah, but in the in the modern university, which is yeah. not so not so easy to combine. But now, if you want philosopher of science want to do um, meaning of life stuff, right? Nothing in what I'm saying prevents that, right? It's not so. Unlike a certain guy, I mean, philosopher says this is not real philosophy. I'm saying, look, there's a lot of philosophy that's not philosophy of science, 
and it behooves us for our philosophers of science to be generous and receptive to the rest of the philosophy, people like me, I must say. Um, but uh, I'm saying is if there is such a thing as philosophy of science, I think it's time for people to actually articulate what that might be. And it's not just the thing that they're doing, because there's also an implied criticism in my view, is that a lot of philosophers of science are recommending projects that actually exclude most of the rest of us. Mm. Right, that's that's the bed of it, no question asked, but here's a way of actually combining a lot of different things. Now, yeah, I'm not saying this is the only game in town, right? But, but it's meant for um, for debate and champagne. Yes. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, I was, I was yeah. yeah, I know. Well, you go. Um, there was question. Yeah, there are two questions here. Yes, yes. And for a long time. And Emily as well. Emily? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Emily. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I was just curious about why the definition of scientific philosophy was limited to the special sciences, because it strikes me that the methodology that you describe is also very applicable to the philosophy of physics. And Many of the techniques in your list do get used in the philosophy of the Oh, I think philosophy why, why is also special science. Oh, You're what? one of us. What is, what is not special science? Then? Well, that philosophy of general science is not special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I think uh, by the, the way philosophy of physics has evolved, uh, it's now very much a philosophy of the special sciences. So in that sense, we just have a terminological. Now, you might think unfair of me because you're dealing with the most fundamental stuff, right? And then we have a real debate, but that's a different debate, right? I'm, I'm happy to have that debate. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, but, uh, have usually you had the special sciences used to refer to sciences other than physics? Yeah, but I, I, I think we're, we're beyond that. Oh, sure. So, yeah, quick comments. Thank you very sure. much. The first one is. Um, something that I thought right at the beginning when you were talking to me about the special sciences and then we gave examples later. Um, and the, the general problem that is shared with other areas such as philosophy of, I don't know, the arts and then the special arts that are not taken into account, like dance, hip hop, graffiti, and philosophy of religion, that why don't we look at the voodoo and the you know intersections between, I don't know, yoga and Ayurvedic practice. This kind of stuff. So there is a something in common, like this, as this, this sort of fundamental problem that sometimes us philosophers in our self images, we, um, yeah, we, I think we see each other in, in a very distorted way, regarding with what others can look at us. And then I would like to finish with this sort of addressing something that Marcus said about what kind of questions in this in an agenda such more heterogeneous as such uh, as, as the one you were proposing, like for the next event, perhaps Marco. Now that we spend the last days talking about uh, if it is useful or not, philosophy for sciences and vice versa, and then now dig into more into how are we useful for each other, looking at specific cases coming from different areas. And like, there are many, many ways in which us philosophers can be helpful for scientists and vice versa, especially because our job is not the same. We philosophers, we deal with concepts, arguments, and not with things as the science. So I would just like to finish saying that, um, yeah, we should make our self-image as philosophers more heterogeneous, as you suggest, as I understand you are suggesting, and uh, yeah, bring more variety and diversity into the table, including in terms of like now not perhaps being so concerned about if philosophy can be helpful for the sciences, but how particular styles of philosophy, such as your synthetic philosophy, uh, can help specific areas of science to uh, engage in better conversations. Um, we're vibing along yes. similar paths. Um, one or two anecdotal comments. The last I checked, which was a few years ago, there was really only one paper on the philosophy of political science. Uh, by Bruno Forbeck, somebody I know, he wrote it before I went into political science, so I'm not suggesting causal connection. But that's it's really striking because it's a gigantic discipline, actually, now has access to power in lots of ways because the economists discredit that for themselves a little bit, and also because it arises from populism, populism. Political scientists are getting years of them, um, and we philosophers have shown no interest. In um, the other thing I want to say is that, um, and this is a bit of a 
I feel a bit uneasy about the conference is I feel that all, there are a lot of moral and political philosophers that engage with the sciences on many different levels and that are actually, you know, medicine, not uh, institutionalized in other places, not ordinarily. And, um, and I feel like uh, a community of philosophers of science should, should remember that uh, there are quite a few philosophers that have genuine expertise in how to engage with the sciences and also locally improve them morally. I mean, this you know, part I have a paper on digital ethics that I, I is a part is a contribution to that genre. Um, um, I also, you know, if you listen to who the scientists who were at this conference who they praised, they weren't people who are on my list. Right? I mean, that's also a selection effect because we heard a lot of biologists and people in biomedical science uh, talk. Uh, but um, you know, uh, Bennett came by, Fugger came by. Um, well, Fugger is less of a synthetic philosopher. Um, Peter Gottfried Smith, we saw him with the picture of the book. Um, so it's not like um, uh, this isn't already happening. That's right. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, and then what's it? Don't forget Emily. Oh, oh no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for this talk. I was uh, pleasantly surprised uh, to see that the person who actually introduced this uh, analytic to uh, our method of being philosophy was, as you know, perhaps uh, Bertrand Russell. And I was like, Bertrand Russell, Bertrand Russell. Yeah. But I think Bertrand Russell would have agreed with uh, a lot of what you're presenting mm -hmm. here. In terms of this vision of how philosophy is supposed to be done in the future. So, if you look at his uh, lectures before the French Philosophical Society, he talks about analytic realism. And then in the lower lectures, he talks about you know, our knowledge of the, of, uh, of the of our knowledge of the external world. He thinks that philosophy should be heading in the direction that you are suggesting. Um, but in particular, piecemeal approaches, um, specialization, and so on. Um, so like the terms analytic philosophy, synthetic philosophy, um, begin to look um, like labels. And like Russell would be like, yeah, I think I agree. Uh, synthetic philosophy is uh, a good way of doing philosophy uh, in the sense of uh, it matches the vision I have. And the fact that I call it an analytic philosophy does not um, so much rule out what you're calling synthetic philosophy. It, um... Uh, so um, thank you, first of all. Um, um, I've recently been blogging quite a bit about Russell, so he's on my mind. Um, and I do think um, um, uh, Ru Russell's general view is not that far from what I'm saying, but he does make a rather sharp distinction between philosophy and other important intellectual projects many of which I would consider deeply philosophical. Um, and, uh, and I think that has done damage to this, to analytic philosophy as it unfolded. Right, so things that have to do with value in particular, Russell was very critical of, I mean, not critical of in a sense that he didn't admire and think it important. In fact, in many ways, it's clear that Spinoza is one of his most favorite philosophers. But not in virtue of the fact that Spinoza is, uh, is doing philosophy, he's actually getting access to something mystical and important as an, ex as an exemplar of how he's thinking about this division. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm not against uh, people saying, hey, there are a lot of premonitions of what they're doing in Vienna and in Russell, actually Ernest Nagels as somebody, but I also think actually has a lot of premonitions of what I'm saying, but all of that generation also felt it rather important to deny important things that are genuinely, in my view, philosophical as being properly philosophical. I notice, uh, Marco, my, I'm saying that it is a task for synthetic philosophers to handle the demarcation problem, right? So there is a, there is a question of what expertise is and what are the normative criteria in it. Um, so in some sense, I am returning to what I consider the grand tradition. Mm -hmm. um, it's not my main topic, but I, I do think that the founders of analytic philosophy were a bit quick, and perhaps in context, understandable quick, but ruling things out. 
and thereby um, conveying a dismissive attitude to their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. But I think for us now, we need slightly different um, narrative. But it's absolutely true that Russell, especially, I mean, I think he goes much further than I go, wants to situate uh, philosophy within the division of labor and very much thinks in terms of uh, denying the great man the the cult of genius thing that I'm also adapting, right? I mean, in that sense, he's really uh, a guy in life. But on the other hand, uh, given uh, some of his polemics, he's also, um, uh, and some of his character traits, <laughs> he's, uh, he's, uh, he's not the best uh, vehicle for my, for my narrative. Yeah? Exactly. Uh, just a brief comment. I was very surprised of your description of the story of the Tower of Babel as, yeah. as, a, as a, an example of division of labor. I think if you're looking for an example of division of labor in the Bible, this already happened with the two brothers, Cain and Abel. Yeah, but that, that <laughs> and, and it didn't well, it didn't end well for them either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, the, uh, we're now going to end up in Protestant theology, right? Because <laughs> how to read the status of work in a division of labor in Genesis is really um, yeah, the project of uh, Calvin to Weber. And uh, that's a cool project, too. That's why I only put up the slide. But um, yeah, there are other, other places I can start that narrative. As Spinoza, in his analysis of the Bible, also emphasized the vision of labor, but then points to the dangers of corruption uh, from luxury, right? So that's his interpretation of what goes on in particularly for both the Canaanites and the Hebrews, right? So in fact, um, another point of the thing is if, if I had my way, I would, as a serious joke, rewrite the history of philosophy as reflections on the effect of the cognitive division of labor and what our role in it, in it is in it. And we find that many, many important philosophers have, I think, very interesting things to say about that. Thank you.